I am trying to get everybody logged on here, you guys. So bear with me. Just hang, hang tight. Hang tight. I'm trying to get everybody on. Hang tight. Admit all. Admit all. Admit all. Hang on, you guys. I'm having some difficulties getting everybody in here. Just bear with me. I'm trying. And then there's another one, and here comes one more. Hang on. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I'm late this morning. I've had a little bit of a some hiccups this morning, but I'm back on it now. I see all my peeps in here. Hello, my sisters. I sent you an email. I was going to call you as soon as we're done today, okay? You sent us an email? Okay, we'll look for it. Okay, and I, I'm going to call you as soon as we're done on here today, okay? <laughs> okay, great. All right, perfect. And then I see Arlene. Hello, hello. Hi, Hi. Hope, you're, hope you are okay. I don't know what happened to you last week. I am, I'm actually doing all right. Here comes Good. more people. I'm trying to get everybody in here again, you guys. I'm very, very sorry that I'm late. I apologize. Um, everything's doing okay. Um. I just so everybody knows I am no longer associated with a law firm. Mm -hmm. So I am being um, ever diligent on what's being said. <laughs> um, uh, there's changes coming, there's changes about, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more with the apartment association and getting more involved in that level. Um, so I think that's a good thing all the way around. And we're trying to uh, help the apartment association spread its wings and grow a bit, if you will. So um, focusing on areas that need more attention and more support from us, obviously, and uh, gonna be um, trying to work in, in that direction, as well as continuing to provide education training courses for you folks. Um, I know we have questions, I'm sure, from yesterday's Agua meeting. <laughs> if anybody was in here and you saw that, I'm sure you had a few um, things that you wanted to add. Um, I wanted to add some things. I'm still letting people in, you guys, so please bear with me. <laughs> I wanted to add some things, okay? So, Last week, although I was unavailable, we did have some interesting things going on with some fires in our areas, okay? Um, we had a very nasty, interesting fire start in Orange County, and it actually spread um, rather rapidly into Riverside County and affect them as well. We had houses, um, with damages not only from fire, but also from smoke in the fire that started in the, on the, I'm thinking the LA side. <laughs> and then it came over the wilderness and got into the Wrightwood area and actually hit the desert floor. And then we had the fires that started in Highland and went up towards our mountain communities, and that wasn't fun either. From all of this, the governor declared a state of emergency, okay? Please pay attention right now. If any of you, any of you currently have, hang on, I'm letting more people in, any of you currently have a 90-day notice of rent increase in effect, okay? Anybody out there have a 90-day notice of rent increase waiting for that date for their rent increase to take effect? You may want to consider rescinding the notice. Let me explain why, okay? <laughs> If you raise rents over 10% during a state of emergency or declared state of emergency or 30 days after the declared state of emergency, it could be considered price gouging during a state of emergency. They made this law so that it would stop those people, and I say those people 
and you'll know who I'm talking about when I explain, those human beings <laughs> that took advantage of a catastrophic event. Example, we have an earthquake, okay? And all of the gas stations are selling batteries for 20 bucks and a gallon of water for $10, <laughs> cash only. This law stops that. The problem is, is in this law, California Penal Code 396, paragraph B, they specifically mention rental housing as one of the products for consumers to purchase during the state of emergency. So what this law is meant to do is it's meant to stop those people that jack up the prices during catastrophic events, earthquakes, floods, fires. We all see it on the news. People are in line at the gas station to buy a gallon of water and they want 10 bucks for it or batteries and they're $20. And I shouldn't say that because with the state of the current inflation, a pack of batteries is $20. So maybe I could say $100 and you guys will know what I'm talking about in more detail, right? This law is to stop that. They also applied it to rental housing. So in the event you do more than a 10% increase, you could make yourself susceptible to that law coming at you. But Patty, 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 my tenant lives in San Diego. They weren't a victim of that state of emergency that happened in San Bernardino. Really? Are you sure? Because they have family that came running to them when they were evacuated or that they helped. They could claim that they were affected. Affected. It's a very broad term that could be easily argued on either side. And my opinion is to err on the side of caution and don't put a foot in the pond. The reason being the consequences are steeper than I want to waver. You know, risk versus reward, okay? Well, the reward is I got to raise my rent over 10%. The risk is six months in jail and a $10,000 fine, and I don't look good in orange, <laughs> okay? So I'm telling you, if you currently have one of those out for more than 10%, be cautious. A state of emergency was declared. We need to pay attention to that, okay? Also, you may have tenants that are mad because they had to evacuate. A lot of people did in the Highland area, in the Riverside area, in the Upland area, in the Lake Elsinore area. In, and, and I know I'm missing places, so don't get mad at me if I miss something, but it, it, it's kind of all over the place, okay? This fire spread quickly. Our mountains are dry. Our wind was not helping and neither was the weather, okay? With that said, we may have tenants that come to us with smoke damage issues, okay? And there's one thing I learned about smoke damage, and we're going to have some in-person classes coming up, one coming up in Carson uh, in October, and one coming up in Rancho Cucamonga in October, in person with me. And we're going to be talking about what to do in case of a, an event like a fire. And you have fire residue and smoke residue on your walls. You don't want to touch it. You don't want to walk on the floor. Okay? You, If you're dealing with some heavy smoke residue issues, don't try to clean it up. It needs to be done professionally. There's special tools for it. You are going to smear it, make a mess, and make it worse. Trust me, <laughs> okay? The fire smoke is not something that, uh, here, let me say it this way. Fire smoke is over my pay grade. And unless you're a certified renovator, it's over yours, okay? It's not something you wanna try to clean up, approach or deal with, especially if they have allergies or they're asthmatic or they're sensitive. I mean, let's face it. I was in downwind from three fires coming at me during the that two week thing. And I did have an escape route. I was planned. I'm not, I wasn't afraid. There wasn't anything to worry about, but my eyes were burning. My throat was burning. It was horrible. And by the second day of it, I mean, I was miserably uncomfortable to the point where I was using eye drops and trying to take something to soothe my dry, scratchy, burning throat. Okay. 
On a side note, just to be funny, my daughter calls me on the second day of dealing with all the smoke because three fires I'm downwind from, so they're all coming at me. And she says, Mom, the fire smoke over by your house is just horrible. I can't breathe. I'm choking. And I'm like, where have you been? It's been like this for two days. She goes, not where I live. And I said, oh, I'm coming over then. <laughs> Here I come. I mean, it's only three miles down the road, but hey, I had no idea three miles down the road was such a big difference. I can tell you that it causes headaches. It causes problems. Uh, hello, I just went through it. Burning throat, itchy, watery eyes, burning eyes, uh, headaches. It's a, it's a real thing. So if your tenant is complaining about those things, the best thing that they can do is remove themselves from the equation. Get out from being downwind. Hello, duh. I didn't realize uh, my escape from the fire smoke was so such a quick escape. Only three miles down the road further, I would have been fine, but I had no idea because it was all around me. Fire smoke everywhere. And not like I was running from the fire itself. I mean, I, the, the, I was nowhere near an evacuation zone. Okay, let's make that perfectly clear. I was dealing with nothing but fire smoke. But to somebody that's sensitive to it, that can become a problem. And we can get those kinds of complaints. We need to act accordingly. If they need to be relocated because of a state of emergency, that would be a call to their renter's insurance. Yes? Oh, easy button. You know, every once in a while we get to hit that easy button, not often. And I would always offer to pay for their deductible because if your tenant is being asked to leave by a government order, they shouldn't owe rent. It's not your fault, but it's not their fault either. And you are the bigger person. Okay. What if your house burns down? What about all their stuff in there? Yeah, it causes you some problems. You have insurance. You're going to go through some red tape. You're going to rebuild. You're going to this. You're going to... What about that tenant? What if that was you? Okay. We need to think about those things when a natural disaster happens that is no one's fault out of everyone's control. And we need to make sure that we're not exposing ourselves to lawsuits by jacking up rent prices <laughs> by more than 10% during that time period because there's no case law. It doesn't say in the law, it doesn't say by someone affected by that area of the state of emergency. It doesn't say by the area. It says by the victim, by the person affected. Affected to what extent? I don't know because there's no case law. So error on the side of caution, don't expose yourself to that. Nobody looks good in orange, okay? Well, I can think of a few people that look good in orange, but <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? Just saying. All right, anybody have questions? Otherwise, I'm going to talk briefly about Prop 33 and Prop 34, but I don't know what I did with my notes. Um, what I want to tell you about Prop 33 and Prop 34 is simply this. We need to come together as a team, okay, and come up with a way to help our landlords, our friends, our family, our relatives, and everybody else we can think of, okay? Send Christmas cards before November, <laughs> before voting day, okay? And put this on your Christmas cards. But we need to think of a catchy way to remind people no on 33 and yes on 34. Because when they get their ballot, they're just numbers and it's just yes or no, right? So we got to get them to remember no on 33 and yes on 34. We haven't figured out how to associate the two, but we're finding a lot of people are saying it wrong. <laughs> okay. It's easy to mess up or they go, I know it's no first and then yes, but what numbers are they? So it gets a little bit um, confusing, okay? It gets a little bit challenging. Thank you, Arlene. I'm going to talk about that first and then I'll go to the question above you because you're, you're a quick answer for that. Everybody, Arlene is putting in the chat that Larso security deposit rate is 0.52%.
Does everybody know what she's talking about? I hope so. If you have a property that is governed by LARSO, and please take note that LARSO has spread like cancer during COVID and affected 144 cities within the county of Los Angeles that are now registered under the DCBA, right? Oh, Patty, that's not Larso. It's run out of the same building. They somewhat follow the same guidelines and you're now capped to almost the same rent amount. Hello. Okay. It is very similar. And parts of LARSO are now in in areas of other cities that don't have restrictions. Example, the city of Torrance has some areas that are now governed by LARSO. So does San Pedro, so does Sherman Oaks, so does the Valley. I mean, I can go, there's a long laundry list of other places that are now governed by LA City's rent stabilization organization, also known as LARSO, okay? And yes, that is exactly what it is. It is the interest that you need to pay your tenant for this year. That rate on the deposit interest is 0.52%. Okay? So that's what she's telling you. Make sure you get that number. It should be on the back of your RSO certificate. At least they used to put it that way. All right. Hi, Val. We got one in Kern. Had a recent kitchen fire and a rental. First, insurance agent came and said the damage was above his pay grade, which was approximately 50K in damage. Okay, Val, my question right there is the insurance agent came out and said the damage was above Whose pay grade? The tenant's maximum coverage or the agent's capability? That is my question, okay? And then the second agent came out, oh, the agent's capability answered my own question. Never mind. <laughs> the second agent came out and minimized the damage to about 30,000, less my $2,500 deductible, 25,000. I'm not, uh... It's called something. It's a private investigator for the insurance companies. Um, and they're a mutual third party rather than an insurance agent that's gonna beat you down on the price. Ask him to tell you what company is available to replace the damage at that expense because you're unable to find one. Provide them with quotes that you get and then tell them which bill you want the, and then they'll pick a bill to pay. So there's a couple ways you can handle this. Um, I'd call PRC Restoration Company and see if they'll go that far out just because I know they do a good job and they'll work with your insurance company directly and they'll fight with your insurance company, okay? So there's a different way you can go about this. Instead of them telling you how much they're gonna pay, you can have your restoration company that you hire deal with your insurance company directly and pay them directly, okay? And that's me trying to help you. Or you could hire the public, oh God, what the heck are they called? Somebody please get in my brain. Somebody out there, please be involved in with insurance enough to know that if you don't like the quote that your insurance company is giving you, you can contact a blah, 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 and the blah, blah, blah will come in as a mutual third party and try to mitigate the issue. A major deduction was depreciation. Everything was seven years old, so they gave me basically nothing for stuff. <sighs> Do you have rebuild insurance on your policy? It's a, it's a stretch but definitely something I would argue. Um, and I would talk to a restoration company. I would, I'd call, honestly, this is what I would do, Val. I would call Yomara at PRC and I'll give you her name and number if you need it, or someone's gonna put it in the thing. Cause you know, we just, that's how we roll around here. 
Yomara at PRC. Um, and what you can do is call her and ask her if she can come out and give you a free estimate because that's what they do and ask her if she would be negotiating with your insurance company directly and try to go about it that way and see if you get a different result all on free estimates from the restoration side of things. Make sense? Just don't let them do any work at all until you get approval from the insurance company, okay? Yomara, Y-O-M-A-R-A. -A. And she's with PRC Restoration Company. And does anybody here have her number? Nobody's typed it in the chat yet. So hang on, let me, I don't know what that means, Margo. PRC. And you have her number, Margo? See? <laughs> Teamwork. Yomara is great, just so y'all know. There you go. Boom. Marlene says, here you go. <laughs> And that's her cell phone number. So just tell her you're a member of Widgets Way. You'll get a free estimate. If she covers that area, I have no idea. If she doesn't cover that area, she's a great resource to help assist you. Like she may send you to some other restoration company and then offer to look at the, at the scope of work for you. Okay. But Yomara, she's one of us. She's a sweetheart. She's a Widgets Wayer. <laughs> she's a Widgeteer. <laughs> And tell her I need some dates. She'll know what you're talking about. Patty said she needs dates. <laughs> I don't ask. I remember that in person classes. Yeah. Um, just so you guys know, and a lot of people don't understand this, when you take a course from Agla and you're like, oh, I took that class from Patty on how to prepare yourself in court last year. I'm not going to take it this year. This year it has new material. Yes, it does have some of the old material, but it doesn't hurt us to brush up on our skills and, and go, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah, I remember this. Um, it's important that we, we make sure we keep our skills in the forefront because it helps us avoid asking unnecessary questions. And nothing makes me feel better when you guys are so mad because you know you're right. You know you're right. And you're sending me the playbook and I'm reading the playbook and I'm going, yeah, you're right. You're spot on. All your ducks are in a row. There isn't anything here that I could tell you that you're necessarily doing wrong or need to do differently. However, you're to the point where you're ready to rip your hair out because you've been dealing with this so long. You want to bang your head into the wall, right? Um, that's why I'm here. I'm here to talk you off that fence. I'm here to remind you that it's sometimes it's expensive to prove that we're right. <laughs> and we need to take different aspects to get to where we are um, and manage our way rather than bash our way with legal threats through the process, right? Um, so when you see that Agla class come back up the second time and you go, oh no, I don't need to do that. I took that last year. Know that you're missing content that's current with today's market, not last year's market, okay? You're dealing with content that's with happenings with what's going on in today's trials and tribulations of property management because it does change often. Um, uh, there's a lot of things I'm starting to see and it's not just in the property management rental market aspect of the industry. It also has to do with financing and the federal lending mortgage rate. And I'm, I'm seeing pieces of the pattern that we saw in 2006 and 2007 happen. And you know what they say, history repeats itself. So with that being said, there's things in the market that are screaming at me because I've seen them before. Okay. Um, I, I have, I have questions and I want to be cautious with them, but I know you guys are starting to see that you don't necessarily have waiting lists at your properties anymore, unless you have low income housing. If you have low income housing, you still have a waiting list. If you're not low income housing, you don't have a waiting list. Am I right? Most likely. You also have some vacants, am I right? Mm. We're seeing a shift in the market. Okay, we're seeing a shift happen. This is when we need to brace for impact. I couldn't tell you what's gonna happen in the election. My crystal ball's broken. 
couldn't tell you what's going to happen with Prop 33 or Prop 34. I don't know. But I can tell you that the economy can't keep going the way that it's going. We need a reset. And it's coming. Because these people can't keep afford to be paying these high rents on their low incomes. Because remember, the price of everything went up on our good working tenant that has a great job. Everything went up. The price of gasoline, the price of housing. Okay, because we did rent increases, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We did rent increases. So we've done rent increases. Their price of housing has gone up. Their cost of living has gone up. Their groceries have gone up. Their paychecks haven't. They're going to start to struggle. And when I say there, let's take that to a different level. Everything in our life has gone up except our paychecks. Well, unless our paycheck is our rent, and yes, we've done that as allowed by law, correct? Or accordingly. But for the most part, we're going to see a shift coming. All the signs and the symptoms are there. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, rewind your brain to back to 2005. Oh, 2006. Ooh. Wasn't there an election in there too? I'm just saying there might've been, I don't know. I should look that up before it comes out of my mouth. I have a sign. I really do. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it or if my camera is not reversed, but here it goes. Oh, man. I hate my background. I have a sign. It says, note to self, just because it pops into my head does not mean it should come out of my mouth. <laughs> so sorry. But things that we need to be thinking about is there's a change coming. We're starting to see it in our industry. Okay, we're seeing more vacant, which is going to cause us to use more incentives and not lower our base rent so quickly like we have in the past, which isn't going to fix the problem. So I got a feeling it's going to be a battle. But what do I know? The tenants did not want to leave and the fire department did not require it. However, not only do they have 30 cats, the woman is on oxygen, but her bedroom is the furthest from the kitchen. I'm curious if there is some form for them to sign saying they won't sue me since this restoration may take a while. Of course, they had no renter's insurance. Are they on a lease term or a month to month? Okay, I got month to money. <laughs> that was good. No, that was good. I knew. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Are they on a CAA lease or a CAR lease? What lease are they on? And you know, I'm going to ask you, what year does it say in the bottom left-hand corner of when it was last revised? And if it's not CAA and it's not CAR, I, I don't have it filed right here. Okay. <laughs> we need to talk about this value. And is it a multifamily dwelling or a single or a SFR? I missed that. Let me go back and see if I can find it. Hang on. Tenants, 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 major deduction, depreciation. Oh, I don't see anything about it. it it's a single family residence. Val. Val. <laughs> find the contract. Find the contract. <laughs> Send me the contract. Um, there's a clause in your written rental contract that states that in the event that the property is totally or partially uninhabitable because it happened in the kitchen, you may be able to terminate the tenancy with a three-day notice to quit. What was the cause of the fire, please, if you will? Please don't tell me the owner's stove shorted out. Please don't tell me it was an electrical fire. Please don't tell me. 
Please tell me it was from cooking. Please tell me it was from a candle. Please tell me it was from, why did the fire break out? When did the fire happen? Because you should have the fire report after 10 business days. Oh, it's a different county. I don't know. Maybe, Kern. I don't know. It was from the range hood. <laughs> give me a copy of the contract. Call me after this. But give me some time. I have another phone call to make first. I'll call you. Okay? <laughs> I'll call you. And if I don't call you by four o'clock, text me. Okay. But I need to see, I need to see some things and then I can help point you in the right direction. There you go. I got to see what your rules say. Okay. And right now everybody's like, wait, what a minute, wait a minute. You can terminate tenancy with a three day to quit, but based on it's car forms, 2008 California association of realtors. The attorney's fees clause is on page five in that contract or on page six? Paragraph 32 or 36. I need to know that. That's going to help me place where the paragraph is that I'm looking for. Attorney's fees clause. Um, it's going to be paragraph 42 or 36. 36 may be about mediation. You guys, is this disgusting? <laughs> is this disgusting? And I can see her contract in my head. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I'm thinking California Apartment Association, CAA, not CAR. CAR's got all the ones with the check boxes. That's the California Association of Realtors. Now I need to see the contract. You may have a paragraph that says something about the property being partially or totally uninhabitable to terminate tenancy, but there's a caveat to that that has to do whether or not they're in a lease term. That's why I asked. Because you, as a landlord, pay attention, folks. If you give your tenants a one-year lease, and I understand some of you have no choice because the city that governs you requires you to start with a one-year contract. So I understand entirely, okay? 32, I told you. Yes, oh, I said 42, but I was looking at the wrong one in my head. Okay, send me the back page of that contract. You have something, and what I mean by the back page is it's in the legal, con it's in the legal jargon you don't understand. Okay, and I want to say it says damage to the premises and it says something in regards to if the property is deemed partially or totally uninhabitable, um, either party may terminate this agreement with a proper notice in writing or something along those terms. The problem with that is, you guys, if you're in a one year lease term, you as a landlord promised to provide them a habitable dwelling. So in the event there's a fire and the tenant caused the fire, okay? And I'm gonna give an example in a totally different manner, but let's see how this goes, okay? <laughs> let's see. I'm gonna use an example of something that happened to me, okay? <laughs> so I had a tenant that didn't clean the stove area or the range hood, and it had such a bad buildup of grease that it caused a house fire that started with the range hood. I hope you hear right between the lines, okay? Because <laughs> it sounds very similar. The tenant didn't have insurance. Because it affected the hood and the stove and the stove got put in the backyard because it looked like a bomb went off in it. 
no joke. <laughs> and I shouldn't say that because I've never actually witnessed a bomb with my own eyes, okay? But damn, nothing I ever cooked on my stove looked like that. <laughs> It literally had the door blown out the front. It got way hotter than it should have is the best. And it just melted. <laughs> it was the craziest thing I've I've seen as far as a kitchen stove being melted. Because of that and the stove being melted, the gas got shut off and red tagged. If there's no stove, the house is uninhabitable under the guidelines of code enforcement, I'm sure. So maybe the fire department didn't do what needed to be done, but I'm sure code enforcement might if they caught wind of it. Okay. So what I did for my tenants, because they didn't have insurance either, is I refunded their prepaid rent for the month and told them that they had to leave immediately. The house was unfit to live in. Not only that, but it causes a lot of smoke damage. What does smoke damage cause? Headaches, burning itchy eyes, irritated throats. It's miserable, okay? And they can't tell me that they're not affected by that. And if you have somebody that's on oxygen, their system's compromised anyway. This is a bad recipe. So with all of that being said, I would state to them that this is not a habitable dwelling and this is a problem. And they begged you not to be evicted, but the reality is you're not getting your house fixed. They're destroying it with 30 freaking cats whom, if you get the right restoration company in there, might talk about a smoke damage. <laughs> I'm being funny. We know that's not going to happen. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh. If the fire report comes back that it's tenant caused damage, I mean, it's not an electrical short at the range hood. And yes, I keep saying those types of things. You may have the capability to get them out with a three-day notice to quit based on the fact that you can't provide them a habitable dwelling and they failed to have renter's insurance, which is a material breach of their lease. And now the owner is suffering financial burdens because of the tenant's not fulfilling their financial capability. That would be the straws that I went, went after anyway. And then just to take that a uh, rabbit down the rabbit hole a little bit further to help you guys, okay? Um, to take it down the rabbit hole a little bit further, let's go down this road, okay? In the event I file an insurance claim and my insurance company pays me a claim of $33,000 or $27,000 minus my deductible, when I do the disposition of security deposit against my tenant, how much money am I charging them? $27,000? I have to charge them what I was charged. So they are being charged my deductible. Okay. And of course, anything else that the fire didn't cover that they left behind, example, a broken window not related, an unpaid water bill, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So just want to take you down that rabbit hole so that you're aware of how that goes. Why can't you go after them for the insurance company? You didn't spend that money. The insurance company did. And the reality of that situation is the insurance company now has the capability to go after your tenant because they have suffered a loss because of them. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. You never know. Julia, that's not true. Let me let me help. OK, if the so if it was landlord caused damage, would she not be able to ask them to leave? Mm, not necessarily, but it may be under different pretenses. Example, if there's an electrical fire at the property at no fault of the tenant 
and they have to leave and they don't have renter's insurance and there's nowhere to go, the first thing I'm going to do is call the Red Cross because they're going to put them up for three days and try to help them. And then I'm probably going to refund their prepaid rents for the month. I'm probably going to refund their deposit in its entirety. And I'm probably going to offer them some help to get them moved out because what if that was you? How would you want to be treated? That's at no fault of yours. Besides, I don't want them to come back and sue me later for breaching the warranty to provide habitable premises. So I'm going to do everything that I can to sugarcoat it so that I don't end up in a lawsuit later down the road. But that's just the way I operate. Error on the side of caution. Stay out of trouble. Get off the fence. <laughs> okay? I hope that makes sense. So I'm not saying that I wouldn't ask her to leave if it was something at no fault or landlord. Oh, we don't want to say landlord cost, okay? Tenant fault or at no fault of the tenant, okay? Because that's how it's going to happen. Wildfire, no fault of the tenant, okay? <laughs> Electrical fire, probably no fault of the tenant. Ignorance. Fault of the tenant. What do I mean by that? Burning a candle near a curtain with an open window. That's, I call that ignorance, okay? <laughs> that would be the fault of the tenant. Putting away hot lawn equipment near party decorations in the garage and then going in the house and shutting the door. <laughs> you know, ignorance. A light fixture in the pool is not working. Do I have to replace by law or can I leave the pool without the light? It's a single dwelling unit. <laughs> In the event someone gets hurt, mind you, we're talking about a swimming pool and they've notified you about a repair that has to do with safety. You bet your butt somebody's going to come after you. Got it? Lights have to do with safety. So they don't trip. It's so they don't fall. It's so they don't ground. Okay. That's my answer to that. <laughs> with that being said, um, it is... Not something I would consider an immediate habitability issue or I would be issuing a rent credit for, but it is something I would be talking to my pool man about addressing and how much it was going to cost me. And I'd be putting that in my budget as soon as possible because after 30 days, they could withhold rent, do it themselves. Um, they could claim it as a habitability issue after 30 days. Anything that's not a habitability issue after 30 days can become a habitability issue if you, the landlord, don't fix it. And for me personally, that's a safety issue, hands down all day long. And I don't want the liability. And I didn't mean to scare you, but I wanted to say it in a way that you understood how it can come back and bite you if you don't fix it. And how easily, and, and let me, let me, let me change it up a bit, okay? So the guys came over, they all got drunk and had a bachelor party, and then everybody went to the bar, even though they were drunk, and the limo came and picked them up, but nobody noticed that Eddie wasn't with them, because they were all drunk, so they were drunk when they fell and hit their head and fell in the pool, but nobody knew he was in there because the light wasn't on. So now it's all back on you. I'm not trying to scare you again, I'm just trying to show you how easily things get convoluted and flipped right back in your direction. Okay, so for me, anything with the pool, or, uh, no, I I'm not going to say that. Anything regarding safety, I'm going to correct immediately. And I used to get mad at neighbors, our tenants all the time. You guys are calling me because your light bulb's burned out in the hallway. Have you seen me? I'm four foot nothing. I can't reach it either. You know, <laughs> get your kid, <laughs> call a neighbor. But the reality is you don't want them 
standing on a chair because most of them don't own a ladder and that's not tall enough in a stairwell because they're trying to reach that recessed light in the middle of the hallway that nobody can ever get to. And now they're piling things on top of things. And if they fall and break their neck in the house, who's responsible for that? No, I'm sorry. Who's liable? Okay, so sometimes there's things that we want to do ourselves just because we don't want to expose ourselves to the liability that's going to happen if we say no. And yeah, in all fairness, the tenant knows better. They shouldn't have stacked a chair on top of their exercise ball to stand in the stairwell to turn on to change a light bulb. But they fell in your house. What do you think is going to happen? Okay, hang on, let me go back here. I'm thinking it was a greasy range hood. Hey, Val, hey, you're gonna need to see that fire report because how did the Grange hood catch fire? And if it was an electrical fire, I think the fire department would have noted that. But that's a question you're gonna have to ask the powers that be. And I'd ask that question. Do we know if it was a grease fire or electrical fire? Do we have some clarity there? Just curious. I have a question, Patty. Yeah. Uh, that apartment with the lady with a bunch of grease on the stove, uh, wouldn't be partially the fault of the landlord for not doing the inspection at least every six months? No. Because even if you did an inspection every six months, do you have the capability to force them to clean that up? A three-day notice, you know. And then you're evicting. And what do we want to avoid? Evicting. There's other ways you can force somebody to clean something up, just so you guys know. But could they put that kitchen fire for the tenant not cleaning on the landlord? It's a stretch. Could they? Yes, they could do anything. But I, I don't see that happening if it's grease fire. That's cleanliness. And I hate to say it this way, but that's just a common sense one. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, hang on. There are lights all over the pool area. I get that. But the one that's in the pool, that when a problem arises, that's the one they're going to blame on you. You understand? I'm not disagreeing with you. What I'm telling you is they're going to paint a picture in a whole different direction, honey. And what I said sounds horrible. <laughs> David, where'd you go? You left. Are you coming back? Um, There are lights all over the place. Okay. We, okay. Fix the pool light. You must be able to see a dead body down there. Fix the pool light. You must be able to see a dead body down there. Okay, Val, thank you. <laughs> I get why, though, to fix the pool light from what I understand, because I have a friend with a pool light that's out, and it's been out since I've known him. And I'm like, why is a pool light out? Why don't you have a pool light, man? What's the story? Because instead of that, he has this thing that floats on top and does like this disco ball thing. And he's like, that's my pool light now. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Tell me the story of the pool light. Well, apparently he has an older pool with an older light fixture. And in order to replace the light in the pool, he has to drain the pool lower than the light level. Okay. Playing along. His pool man says if he drains his pool lower than that light level, that it's not going to handle being exposed to the elements very well. So once we get down there, we can figure out which light we need and then special order it. And in the meantime, your stucco or the pool lining, the gunite, whatever you call it, is exposed to the elements and your pool is so old and it's in such condition that it's just gonna crumble and you're gonna have to end up draining and restuccoing the whole pool. So 
my friend doesn't have a pool light anymore because even to drain it and just find the light bulb, he wants over $500. I don't know how much they want to fix your pool light, but I get an estimate and find out. And if it's got to be empty for some time, please take that into consideration because someone may not point that out to you. Right? <laughs> I mean, think about it this way. If a guy says, I'm going to do your roof and instead of charging you $12,000, I'm going to charge you $8,000. And you're like, yeah, okay, this is cool. This guy's going to do this. He's going to do my roof. He's going to do it for less money. He pulls the roof off in one day and it takes him 16 weeks to put it back on. <laughs> oh, now you have no roof on your house and your tenants in there. Yeah, that's a problem. So... Again, anything can happen at any given time. We want to limit our liability and how they can make us liable. Okay. Anybody have anything else they want to talk about chit chat? More than welcome to unmute yourself or type your questions in the chat. Um, I do have a question, Patty. Sure. Um, I did have many years ago when the tenant moved in and uh, without knowing, I, I gave him a very simple rental agreement, mm -hmm. but as the law right now, very um, severe to the landlord, I like to update it. And I heard you said I could do three day notice to change a tenancy and agreement by a addendum. It depends on what city you're in. What city are you in? It's, um, it's Temple City, but is belong to um, DCBA. Uh, yeah. So I'd have to look. And yes, see, I do know some of this stuff by heart of who governs where. <laughs> right. So I'd have to look it up on the Stay House LA website to see what rules govern you to see if the tenant has to sign and agree. Because if in, in and I don't think so at this time, but that could change. Let me give you an example. Under LARSO, L-A-R-S-O, in order for you to do a change that would affect a tenant along those lines, they would have to sign and agree to it. If they don't sign and agree, you can't do the change. But that's under certain municipalities. And off the top of my head, I don't know what the municipality rule is. So yes, you could. It's better it's a better business practice to approach your tenant in, in this fashion. Hey, I was looking at your rental agreement the other day, pulled it out to look at something and realized that you're on a really old contract. And there's been so many law changes and so many new disclosures that are now required for tenants, letting them know what the rules are that protect them. So if you don't mind, I'd like to give you a new rental agreement to review and all the disclosures that go with it and have a look at it so that you can see it. And then we'll get that signed and get that on file so that we're, so that we're, um, we all know what the rules are. Okay. See the Counting. approach? Yeah. <laughs> so everything is in the approach. That's true. Okay. Maybe, maybe you come, one month you, rent free. I'm sorry? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you should uh, try to give a month of rent free. No no, 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 I, I wouldn't, anytime I wouldn't you offer, that right yet. Right. Anytime you offer money, they tend to think. <laughs> and, and there's other things that you can do, but but at this point, you're you're just telling them, hey, the last time you signed an agreement was a long time ago, and the rules yeah. have changed since then, and there's a lot more stuff protecting you. I want to make sure you know what that is, so I'd like to give you the newest contract. I'm going to tell you, in the event you present it that way, Make no changes. In other words, don't use this as an opportunity to jack up the price of the security deposit or jack up the rent or do a rent increase or uh-uh-uh-uh. This is even Steven and you're just trying to do what's right. So don't go throwing a bunch of rule changes at them that you don't want to deal with. You know what I mean? That's not fair. Um, that sounds good. And the okay. That keeps you most ethical. But Patty, these rental contracts between you and me, uh, they are mostly on the side of the landlord. So if someone is on a verbal agreement and then you bring the rental contract, it's all about 
protecting, uh, I mean, these lawyers wrote these rental agreements to protect the landlord. So they, they see the big difference. Mm. And there is a way to make those changes from an oral agreement to a written contract, but it is very detailed. It does not work in some municipalities, meaning the cities that govern you. Um, but I'll, I'll be quite frank with you and tell you back in the day, BC, before COVID, okay? So not too long ago, back in the day, but back in the day, okay? Back in the day before COVID, in the event you had someone that was being a difficult tenant in the city of, uh, in the county of San Bernardino, okay? In the county of San Bernardino, whether it be in Fontana Court or it be in Victorville Court, whatever. Back in the day, in the event that you had an oral agreement and you needed it to go written contract, the correct process and procedure would be to go talk, knock and talk. That's your way of managing it. If you can't manage it and you need to enforce it, then back in the day, what we were advised to do was serve a 30-day notice to change the terms of tenancy. And the terms that you're changing is the attached written rental contract to take effect in 30 days. And you're not using this to add any anything. You're getting them to get on a written contract, okay? So you're not, again, you're not adding a rent increase. You're not adding a security deposit increase. You're playing even Steven and giving them a set of written rules to follow or making sure you're disclosing all of their rights depending on which way you're looking at it okay because it comes from both sides of that fence is this still doable patty is that what you just said is still doable without having them sign you do a change of tenancy and then attach the rental contract to it and nobody signs it yes it is still doable in some areas, okay? Under some conditions, okay? What we're gonna do it, for example, in Los Angeles County and leave it to God to decide what happens later. I'd be talking to an attorney if you were gonna do that in Los Angeles County. Why would I be talking to an attorney? Because I'd wanna make sure that they would argue that point and represent me in court. And if they say, no, that's not something I'm gonna argue in court, I'm gonna call a different attorney until I get the answer I want. If I can't find the answer I want, I'm not doing that. But in San Bernardino County, Riverside County, all day long. Why? We don't have much that governs us. Make sense? You are very wise, thank you. Right? Hey, I, 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 I don't want to stick my neck out there and then have somebody chop it off. I want to, I want to, you know how police look their head around the corner and they bob like this to make sure nobody's standing there with a gun. That's how I look. Okay. I want to look first, bob my head back in, see if anything's coming at me. If nothing's coming at me, then I might stick my head out a little further, but I don't want to sign up to be in a lawsuit. And I don't want to sign up to be in an orange jumper. I just don't. Okay. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, there's just some things I won't challenge. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Larso, new roommate with roommate addendum only. No lease with the new roommate. How to proceed with new lease. Hold on. Suri. Let me explain to you how this works. And everybody else, if you're not sure, listen up, okay? Okay. When you have a written rental agreement, if you're changing this written rental agreement, you use an addendum. So you changed your written rental agreement to add a roommate to it with an addendum. And now together, that is the written contract that all parties must follow. But there is only one, one addendum, so it's missing the other part. What do you the mean? Lease. There wasn't a lease to begin with? No. 
And, and the reason I'm saying that because all of a sudden the, the new roommate brought her sister and she comes and goes for a week or two. And then the other roommate is complaining, saying there is too much, too much noise. She, you know, so that there are squabbles between the two. Do you collect separate rents from each roommate or do you collect the rent combined? Combined. Then if they're having a problem with each other, they have to handle it with each other. That's not your problem. Okay. Okay. And that's what you need to tell them. I don't do domestics. If you're having a problem with your roommate, I suggest you get a new roommate. Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll try. I'll, I'll take take we'll your say. take yourself out of that equation. It's no different than if a husband and wife are having a freaking argument. You're not going to go get in the middle of that, right? Don't go right. get in the middle of this. No, 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 no. We don't get paid enough. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. How can you force someone to clean their house? Linda, you paying attention? It depends on what city you're in. I would not do this in LARSO, and I don't know that I'd even do it in the county of LA. But here's what you can do. If you have a written rental contract that says they're supposed to keep their unit clean of trash and debris, you can send them a letter telling them that this is not clean up to your standards of the trash and debris and tell them specifically what needs to be addressed. You cannot just say, clean your house, you filthy pig. I know that's what we want to say, but we have to say, you have dirty laundry all over the property. Your cupboards are full of crumbs and debris and attracts vermin. Okay. Your food storage is not in a correct, proper manner that could attract vermin. You're not keeping up with your dishes and things that are dirty, along with clothes. You leave out pet food. These are all things that can attract vermin. And you can, under the precedence of a cleanliness, say something about, okay? In the event they don't do what you ask them to, you have options. You could file for an eviction. No, I would never, never, unless it was a pack rat, AKA hoarder, okay? Um, you wanna know what I do? And I've done this before. And I know there's owners out there that have done this before, okay? Is I send them a notice telling them that they have to clean their unit. I do a 24 hour notice to inspect. And then I send them another 24 hour when I'm there telling them that I'm coming back to do necessary or agreed upon repairs. And I have the cleaning lady clean their house. And then I send them a bill for the cleaning that the cleaning lady charged me to clean their house and to clean up the stuff that would attract vermin. Got it? Oh, I like that thing. <laughs> cleanliness is cleanliness, but if you have crumbs in your drawers and all over your floor, what are you tracking? Vermin, rats, mice, cockroaches, insects. You're, it's an attractive nuisance to have a filthy house. Make sense? Okay, so I would then do that, send them the bill, and I've done this before is why I'm kind of half cock smiled, okay? And then when she said, I'm not paying your bill, you could take it out of my security deposit. I said the ever so famous words, security deposits are to be allocated per the California Civil Code 1950.5 once the property has been vacated. Were you going to give me a 30 day notice today? Because if so, I'd be more than happy to deduct that expense from your deposit. Yeah, and that's how Patty goes that quick. Okay. <laughs> and I know it came out fast. Sorry. The other thing that I would say to them in that regards, as far as deposits go, is I can't deduct that from the deposit. The law says that I can't allocate your deposit until you vacate the property. So you're going to have to pay this. Well, I'm not paying it. Okay, now at that point, I have two options. I can either serve her a three-day curable breach of covenant 
to pay the bill. Okay. I can then, if she doesn't pay the bill within that time period, file an eviction against her. I could serve her a demand letter that she makes that payment to me. And if she doesn't pay me within 30 days, I could exercise my rights by filing a small claims case against her for the amount of that expense while she's still living in the property and get a money judgment against her and then pursue collections. There's a lot of things you could do, but let me share one with you that's gonna sting, okay? During COVID, a gentleman hired an attorney and went through an eviction trial and won a jury trial for an eviction during the COVID pandemic. A couple years later, he contacted the firm I worked for for collection purposes to go after the attorney's fees because he had an attorney's fees clause, okay? So he wanted to go after him them for his attorney's fees. So filed lawsuit. Attorney's fees were uh, over $100,000, no joke. Bossed a trial during COVID in LA, it was nasty. Anyway, Basta filed a reduction in fees and got their fees lowered to like 70 grand or 80 grand, something around those lines. So we started, we meaning the law firm that I work for, our collections department started taking the, over the collection process. Do you want to know what happened? Because it'll floor you. It lost. Sorry, my sister was calling. I sent her to voicemail. <laughs> they filed an appeal on the eviction. Basta did. Okay, pay attention. They filed an appeal on the eviction. Looking at a three-day notice in your head, okay? It has to have a phone number on it, right? This particular notice didn't have a phone number on it. So they filed the appeal based on the cause of action being invalid and they won. So now the eviction case is dismissed. It's gone. It doesn't exist. But the landlord still has possession, right? Only now the tenant that was unlawfully evicted is what the ruling came back from the superior court where the appeal or the appellate court, I apologize, is suing the landlord for an unlawful eviction. Yeah, think about that one, okay? Whew. So what happens next? I don't know what's happening next. Currently, the tenant is suing the landlord for unlawful eviction and the landlord's insurance company won't cover it. I don't know what's gonna happen next. I think in the original ask, it was for like 350,000. And there's, I, I have not spoken to that gentleman. I don't know where that's headed at this point. I had three contractors and changed the pool light and they can't find the wires to the light due to the damaged wires. Do you have a pool contractor? Sweetheart, don't call a pool contractor, call an electrician. You have an electrical problem, not a pool problem. Make sense? And sometimes pool men have their own electricians. It's not the same. And worth a shot, most definitely. I mean, what if you call an electrician and they go, oh, the problem is this right here. $400, please, problem solved. I mean,
I hope what I just said to you makes total sense, total sense. And you know that gardener, <laughs> you know that gardener that goes, oh, I could clean up the mess from the septic tank overflowing. No problem. I'll clean that up. He's not certified to do that. He doesn't know what he's doing. How do you know you're not exposing yourself to a hazmat issue? Anybody else have anything? I'm hungry. That's a good sign. <laughs> Trust me. That's a real good sign. I'm hungry. Um, Patty, one quick question, the last one. Um, yeah. If I have a tenant who allow relative to use my facility um, to do some um, plan uh, business, like they selling pot, pans, stuff like that, and then start adding more plan all over my place, and how do I um, warn them that um, to get rid of it because it, it's become too much? At the beginning, it looked like landscaping looked nice. Eventually, they keep add more and more, and now it's like. But I have a feeling that they use it to to have un this size. Un unfortunately, um, I have been mm -hmm. contacted by my insurance company that this could be considered an attractive nuisance and is no longer allowed under my policy. I'm asking you to remove it. I'll give you 30 days. After that, I'm going to do my job and start serving you notices. Okay. So you send them a, a notice of cor correction, not three days. I would, days. I would send them a letter, mm -hmm. but that's me. And my, letting, my letter writing skills are exceptional. Did you take Agla's class yesterday where they talk, we talked about absolute terms and fogging techniques? If you ever write a letter to your tenant, you want to make sure you're reading it for absolute terms and fogging techniques because they don't want those in there. Okay. No, I didn't take that class. I need to, um, so I know <laughs> I've had it enrolled in that class. Do you don't know what the next one's going to be? Um, I do one for them every month Okay. and I'm actually now getting their classes and putting them back on my website and backlinking back and forth. So you'll be able to find it on my website shortly. Watch, okay. watch, watch that webinar so you can learn about how not to put a threat in writing. Okay. I don't okay. basically call it that, but when you listen to what I'm telling you, if you can put the pieces together, that's exactly what I'm saying. This is how you don't put a threat in writing. Okay. this is okay. how you don't threaten them with the words coming out of your mouth <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. it's my way of trying to keep you out of trouble um val you have a bigger problem than you could imagine okay it says another tenant we believe is running a pupper mill i would consider this a business is this a three-day cure or quit notice of course they will deny it they're going to deny it left right and sideways and let patty educate you on something you may not be aware of As of January 1st, 2024, it is illegal to sell a pet in the state of California. You may rescue or adopt, period, end of report. So if they're breeding and raising animals, they're breaking the law. Yes, they're running a business out of the house and it's an illegal business at that. Got it? Daddy, this is Marion. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Uh, I'm going to make it very short. Uh, okay. Back in June, the 1st of June, uh, one of my tenants is a one bedroom. It is in Los Angeles City. It's a one bedroom apartment. He had contacted me to tell me that I would see his mom around for a couple, two to three weeks at the most because he was going to be taking care of her because she had been diagnosed with cancer. That was in June. Now we're all the way towards the end of September. He did not bother to even mention his brother was staying there too. So it's him, his mother, and his brother staying in my one bedroom. I gave him a notice just to read his contract and I quoted that there's only a 14-day stay. What more should I do it's not that 
one bedroom apartment does not accommodate three people. It barely would accommodate two. What, how should I handle that? I'd go talk to him and hear me out, okay? Okay. Okay. I understand what's going on here. And let me completely explain to you that I, the landlord, unfortunately, am about to have to do my job. I don't want three people living in this unit. It's too small. It's a health and safety issue. And quite frankly, it just doesn't work for the size of the building. With that being said, tenant, I understand that you're the caregiver for your mother, but she doesn't live here. You do. Right now, she's an unauthorized occupant, and so is the other person. I really don't want to do my job. I know that she needs care and you're providing it for her, but it's going to have to be somewhere else in the future. I, th again, this doesn't work for me. The rules here are being broken. Having a short stay, I could see, and I get that you're her caregiver, but you should be caring for her at her house, not at yours. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and it's, 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 it's the nicest way you could tell them, I'm warning you, here I come. <laughs> okay. I'm about to do my job. But think about it this way, okay? Mm -hmm. What if something happened and you were that kid? Because I'm assuming this is a young gentleman in this property. Am I right? Oh, no, 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 no. He's in his 60s. His mom is probably okay. close to 90. Okay. What if that was you? And all of a sudden, something happened wherever your mom was and she needed a place to live. You're going to take her in. It's the right thing to do as a good human. Right. Okay. With that being said, if she comes with brother that may be disabled or he also doesn't have anywhere to go, you're going to do it. It's your family. You would do it. You would do it. I would do it. I'm being honest with you. I would do it. I would take in my mother. Hell yes, I would take in my mother. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then it's, we have to make this work. Okay. And if you're going to have the responsibility of taking her in with you, you need to go to a place that accommodates that. Okay. And that is the nicest way that I could say it, because I would do the same thing that this tenant's done. You would do the same thing that this tenant's done. Half the people in this room would, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, yeah, I'd take in my mom. And there's going to be that one person that's going to say, nope, not my mom. I just owned her years ago. So mm -hmm. you're going to get that too. But the reality is, if you would do it and you have to be able to understand why they would do it, it's the human nature part that's missing from this, you know? So I'd warn them first and mm -hmm. let them know this isn't going to happen. I can try to work with you, but by the first of next year, I'm going to be approaching this in a business professional manner. Okay, because it's already been three months going on four. And right. yet, so said just it was let two it, three weeks. Yeah. Right. So, but you're also giving him a date that's feasible. Mm -hmm, you're mm -hmm. not telling him to get out before the holiday. Mm -hmm. What you're telling him is a reasonable request. Okay. 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 And he's going to say, I need more time than that. Okay. I then see. why don't, why don't you give me a notice in writing of when you'll be vacating? Okay. That's very good. And you can't charge additional amount of rent. By adding them either, am I correct? Is this property in Larso? Yes, it is. Why can't you? I'm asking you. I have no idea. Someone told me hold that. Hold on, I hold on, hold on. Okay. Arlene is in the room, I believe. She may still be on here, and she's my Larso guru. I okay. believe under LARSO's ordinance, if you have an unauthorized occupant, you can do a rent increase of 10% for each unauthorized occupant under LARSO's policies. Okay. However, if you do that, they then become your tenant. You can't ask them to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, <laughs> and yeah. Arlene's here. I think it has to, I think oh, it has to be though in your original lease. Yeah. And they may have something in your, oh, do you have a written contract with them? I certainly do. 
read your written or, con or contract about uh, um, unauthorized occupants and see if it says anything about a 10% increase or an increase in rent because of the yeah. occupant. If, if she used the Agler uh, lease, it's in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this one was from 2013. And if I'm not mistaken, there was a place that you can add a dollar amount for any additional added uh, tenants. And I think it was either $100 or $150 per person. As long as it's not over whatever the city allowance is, you should be okay. Example, if the city says you can do a 10% increase and that 10% puts you at $300 and you have in your lease that you're only gonna charge 150, then you're only gonna charge 150. Got it? <laughs> you're not gonna charge the 300 the city says you can. You gotta follow the rules in your contract. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Similarly, in another building, I literally saw on my cameras a gentleman moving in some other people into a two bedroom. When I called him out on it, he tried to say that they were just visiting. So he's brought in a son and he's brought in an adult brother, adult son, adult brother. When I called him out on it, he says, uh, Oh, well, they're, uh, uh, they're visiting. And then he says, uh, no, that's my brother. In other words, what, what's the problem? He came across with an attitude. What was the problem with that? Miriam? Yes? On the 15th day, you're going to serve him a three-day cure or quit for unauthorized occupants. Okay. It's already been over two months. Have you accepted rent? Yes. There's a problem. Okay. Because he said that they, the only reason I did he said they were visiting. Now I've come to realize it's not a visit. You see what I'm saying? So am I still having a problem? Because he-, he it, 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 And here's how I'm going to say it to you. Okay. If you're going to start an eviction because of this matter, mm -hmm. and I know how you function. I got you, baby. I know your brain, okay? okay. If okay. you're going to start an eviction over this matter, I'd be asking that question to my legal counsel that's going to represent me. Okay, okay. And that's me being straightforward with you. <laughs> because I, remember, and the reason I always tell everybody, you need to ask your legal counsel because it's all about what your attorney wants to argue and what they don't. And I don't have that answer. I don't I know. <laughs> got it. I really got it. Um, I wanted to let you know and bring you up to speed on the case that I have been talking with you yeah. about over yeah, the yeah, last yeah. few months. Out of the two, I got one out, and uh, the other one was actually pushing a lot of buttons, uh -huh. and I wanted to let you know how they operate now in L.A. Uh, court. I uh -huh. was in Santa Monica court. You guys are going to find this quite interesting, and this is just the way that they're working now. I know firsthand. Uh, what happened was this person has breached the contract on every level you can imagine. Except yes, I can verify that. Okay. Yeah, and you don't have to go into detail. <laughs> exactly. And I won't. And I won't. So here's the deal. Got got an attorney. I uh, did not know that all these attorneys are working this way after COVID. The attorney that you solicit is not the attorney that will represent you. So within a three week period, I was referred to a different attorney each time. Um, I was not given the right or permission to choose and say if I like the person or not. I would have preferred a male, a bulldog uh, attorney versus a female poodle attorney, okay? And the way that they operate is almost like they're working together. My counsel and the opposite counsel seem like they're working together to keep on adding up the fees. I went to Santa Monica Court in, in the last, what, two, two and a half months, eight times. Each time it cost me $2,400 a day. They did not bother to tell me that they were going to be referring this uh, case out to an attorney that was out in Westlake Village and was charging me until I looked at the bill, charging me $800 a day for a transportation fee, $400 to go to court, $400 to go to home, go back home, and then the $600 hourly fee for the case, okay? Um I'm, I'm down $14,000, and the attorney had actually said to me uh, that uh, you're going to be getting a rather large bill from us because it looks like we're going to be going to trial. And he said that could be anywhere between $20,000 and $30,000. We went to mandatory settlement conference, and 
The judge asked me, what did I want to see happen? And I told the judge, I want her out of my place and she can keep the five months of unpaid rent. And I'll give additional $2,500 for her to leave. That would be a total of 10 grand. The judge stepped out in the hall, came back and said, uh, are you interested in hearing what she wanted to counter your offer to? I said, sure. She said she wants to first offer. She wants to be able to stay in your place indefinitely with you without you ever being able to evict her. And she want like to have several months to pay the unpaid rent over a period of time. I said, that's a hell to the no. <laughs> and uh, she said, and you want to hear the second one? I said, sure. The second one was give her $30,000 in cash today and she'll be out by the end of the month. I said, that's a double hell to the no. I guess we're going to court. But what happened was the very first time once she got additional counsel, she had counsel, he dropped her. She had to get additional counsel. That person, I'm going to put her name out there. If you guys ever hear of Annika, whatever her, Annika Cole, run like hell. She's a Cole, nutcase. C-O-L-E? Yes. Yeah, she crazy. If I remember correctly, I, I don't want to say anything. I know she she's, um. Crazy. We'll we'll just call her a dragon lady, okay? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, and and she, she's all about the money. She wants yes. to settle everything for high dollar amounts. Yes, yes. And so the very first time she was supposed to be there, forgot she was supposed to be in court, uh, in Santa Monica. She was in downtown L.A. They had to call her. They sanctioned her twenty five hundred dollars that time. The next time she came late. They sanctioned her again in another court. Each time it's costing me $2,400 per day. And she asked for- Are another you continue. getting the sanctions? Am I getting them? No, this is just by the court for her failing to perform. So I- uh, oh, Whoa, ahead. whoa, 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 whoa. I would petition the court to see if any of that sanction money belongs to you. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to see, I'm going to write this down right now. Sanctions. The, okay. the reason, the reason why, and let me just explain so everybody has an understanding. And for those of you that don't understand what sanctions are, those are fines implemented by the court. They're called sanctions. So basically what she's saying is because she, that attorney forgot to come to court, the court fined her. How much did you say? 2,500 bucks? 500. Mm -hmm. 500. However much they sanctioned her because Miriam was out of money by paying her attorney and her to show up that day. So that's, that's why I said, find out if that sanction money is to go to you and your attorney, because that's usually how that works. Well, unfortunately, I I, I uh, fired my attorney as of Friday before last because I can see that they were continuously. Ask uh, about the sanction money. OK, OK. okay. The only thing they said in their letter is that they were still going to try to hold her to her sanctions, but they're no longer representing me. I felt of course they want to hold her to their sanctions yes. because if they collect it, they're going to want to keep it. And not, yeah, not me get anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'd be, I, I, you want clarity on that. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. I will be contacting them once I get off of this call. Bottom yeah. line is I went ahead and I requested the attorney. Let, let, that let me say it. A different mm -hmm. way, just so you understand, okay. in the law firm that I was in, <clears throat> or law firms that I've been in, because I have been in more than one, okay. anytime the opposite counsel was issued sanctions, when we received those payments from the court or from opposing counsel, mm -hmm. we immediately deposited them to our client because they're the ones that are suffering. Okay. 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 And okay. I'm not saying that that's the practice of that particular law firm that you used. I'm just sharing with you what we, what I've seen happen in the past. Okay. I okay. really appreciate that. I'm going to be writing a letter to them to find that out. Yeah. Um, but what about I, the sanctions? I want my sanction money. I want, and I definitely want my sanctions because um, they sanctioned her twice, um, mm -hmm. Twice within three weeks. And then when we went back for the trial again, I mind you, third time trial, uh, she begged of the court to excuse her a day. So that was three times because she said, I have two other cases in the same courthouse today. How much time do you need? Oh, I don't know until I go in. Do you think two hours might be fine? Well, my I'm having to pay my attorney for the two hours while we're waiting for her to go see about trying her cases in the same court. So right. after this happened, I asked, how many times can this happen? 
Um, every every time. And he says, uh, we have a case that has been going on for a year. Yeah, um, every time. To answer you honestly, every yeah. time. That's why right. I tell you guys, stay out of the legal process. It sucks. It's broken. It's, that's what exactly what he said. That was Judge Cho, C-H-O. He said exactly <laughs> that. He said, I feel sorry for you, Mrs. Arsenault. It's, it's a broken system. And he said, I'm the first one to admit it. He yep. said, has anyone bothered to explain to you why it's happening? I says, no, I'd like to know. He says, prior to COVID, we had 40 such judges that handle these cases. During COVID, 30 of those judges either retired or and or quit. And they the have only, not been replaced. Right. And they only have 10 judges in all of LA County, period 10, that represent these types of cases. He says, therefore, we're getting approximately 420 new cases every month. And we try to take the oldest ones first. So how long can this go? Nobody knows. So I'm thinking if I'm having to pay $2,400 or $2,500 each time I come to court, I'm going broke quickly. And she's wanting $30,000 and will not budge, will not budge. So here's the deal. I went in and decided to go ahead and dismiss the case with prejudice because I had already spoken to another attorney and they said, the moment you dismiss it with prejudice, now you can go in for the non-payment rent because you couldn't collect it during the time that the case was being tried or about to be tried or was pending a trial. So now you can go back and ask for collection of all your rent and you can do that by sending her a notice to pay rent or quit. So I wanted to run that by you to get your take. Yeah, but you're gonna be back in the same legal process again with her asking for $30,000. It's gonna be the same. It's if it worked, the if it worked for them the first time, why wouldn't they try the same process the second time? Oh, because I, I'm only thinking because the other, the way I got rid of the other one, she realized that if she lost the case and she was very sure she was going to lose the case, she did not want to lose her Section 8 voucher. Well, that, that you didn't tell me she was, that this person's on Section 8. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Then move forward with legal. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I I felt that that would be the way to go. Move forward with legal, and okay. it's, it's going to rank you, but this person is going to be off of Section 8 at the end of it. Yes, yes, and that's what I'm going okay. for. Okay, um, I'm going to answer G. Jones' question really quick, and it also has to do with you, so pay attention, okay? Okay, okay. In a one-bedroom case, doesn't the law allow for two persons per bedroom plus one in the living room? Ha ha ha, T. Jones. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. No, what you're discussing is not the law. It's oh. called the industry standard. Oh. And it says you can have two persons per bedroom plus one on the couch. That's the industry standard. Oh. G. Jones, G. Jones, you want to know what the law says? Yes. State of California says that for every 690 square feet, you can have up to nine persons. No. Shit, no way. You not. So you better put an occupancy restriction both in your criteria and in your rental contract so that it's enforceable and you're giving all of your attorney all the tools that they possibly can get to go fight that battle for you. Well, guess what? The square footage <clears throat> on that my one bedroom is 675. So how is that applicable? Remove one person. Ah. Uh. Okay. So you're saying that they can be added without permission of the owner? No, 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 no. Okay. He's stating that the law says that the there it's two people per bedroom plus one on the couch. And I'm correcting him. That is not the law. That is the industry standard. And in order to enforce the industry standard, it has to be on your rental criteria and in your lease contract according to my legal counsel, okay? And that's what they're willing to argue. If you have that it's two per bedroom plus one on the couch and it says that on your criteria and it says that on the rental application, then blah, blah, blah attorney is willing to go argue that in court that they're over their occupancy limit, okay? It's whatever that attorney is willing to argue. 
But what I'm telling you is that's not the law. The law says nine persons for every 690 square feet. Okay. So and, and let's be realistic like that. If you have 690 square feet and you have four people in there, mm -hmm. four, not mm -hmm. nine, mm -hmm. you now have dressers over heaters and over windows because there's no place to put the stuff that these people need to sleep, to live, to right. clothe themselves. So now there it becomes a health and safety issue because you can't store that much supporting documentation per human <laughs> okay that's the best way i could describe it okay. and, and i'm talking about four people not nine right so right. hence the industry standard hey and and g jones i am picking on you i'm trying to educate people because it is a difference and it's not the law and if you don't have it in both places then what covers you not the industry standard the law wow wow so what is it for a two bedroom then? What's the maximum? Two persons per bedroom plus one on the couch is the industry standard. Okay. You can have your own rule and say in this three bedroom house, I want no more than three occupants maximum. Okay. Okay. A maximum of three persons, but it has to be in your criteria and in your lease contract in order for an and talk to your attorney. How? What other? Where else do they want that information disclosed so that they're willing to argue it in court? Okay. All right. That's the best way I could explain it to you. Because if you don't have the industry standard, then the law applies, right? Mm -hmm. Patrick, I have <clears throat> I have a question on that with the one on the couch, meaning in the living room. So then someone could technically sleep in the living room and therefore put their bed in the living room, correct? No, it is two per bedroom plus one on the couch. That's the plus one is a couch. It's not, you can put a bed in the living room. So it has to be restricted to just the couch. Uh-huh. Well, gotcha. it's a plus one. Hmm. So look at it this way. If it's a futon, you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. If it's a day bed, you can't do anything about it. So, and then at this point, my question becomes, are you really going to go to court and evict somebody over their choice in the furnishings? No. So just let it go. But on the day, I'm sorry, on the day that I wanted to go in to see for myself and I gave them the 24 hour notice, I now understand from attorney Brennan yesterday, it, you do not have to give a 24-hour notice. You can give a four-hour notice, a six-hour notice. I did not realize that. Bottom line was, when I gave served him this guy a notice last month that I wanted to come in, he conveniently made it impossible for me to go in. So uh, what I saw on the camera the night before is they moved the furniture out, and then once the day had gone by that I did not get inside, they moved, moved the furniture back in the following day on camera i got a question and i'm just dumbfounded right now okay? okay okay an attorney told you that you could give less than 24 hours notice and gain legal entry if it's an emergency i can't remember if he said it was emergency or non-emergency but he says you everybody slow down slow start. down slow down okay. if it's an emergency mm -hmm. meaning fire flood mm -hmm. death I mean, it could be anything, but it's got to be an emergency to where the owner has the right to preserve their real property. Okay. okay. In other yeah. words, water is running, mold is growing, fire mm -hmm. is burning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No notice is required. None. Okay. okay. Here I come. This is an emergency. Mm -hmm. And now you're calling the police, telling the police, this is an emergency. I have a right to preserve my real property. You make them let me in. There's water running in this unit. I went through that with the same case that I had dismissed uh day before yesterday. I went through that. The cops came she, while the cops were there and their sergeant. They called in the sergeant. We were there for four hours. Okay. Um, bottom line is they eventually let me in, but not to do an inspection, only for me to let the plumber in for me to point out to the plumber what needed to be done. To this day, since she moved in, four years later, 
I have not done a thorough inspection of my unit. Every time I've gone to do it, I had to call LAPD. L she get We get there, she calls LAPD inside and says, I need to speak with you first. They come back out and said, we don't really know if we have the legal right to escort you in. They've said this each and every time I have all of their cards. Where is your desk sergeant? Where is your watch commander? I actually had the sergeant to come and she went in and she says, are you willing to put them up in an apartment? In an apart, um, in a part, no, an apart, in a hotel. I said yes. While I, I'm doing a move, uh, an inspection, no. no, they can march their happy little ass out the door, and you can do your job. I'm in compliance with California Civil Code one nine five zero point five. This is considered an emergency. There is no notice that's required. I'm gaining entry. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And that's the wrong civil code. Mm -hmm. It's nineteen forty two. Yeah. They would not let me in, Patty. Bottom line, LAPD. They said they did what they could. They said they they did what they could. How much uh, money do we have to spend to prove that we're right? I'm I, and, and that's why I am saying that I've gone through this now every year, twice a year since she's been there. When I, I and, and there was a plumbing problem, so they were going to have to take her toilet out in order to fix this plumbing problem. So the sergeant asked me what I pay to put her in a hotel. And, and I asked the, the plumbers, how much time do you think you need? They said, put her up for three nights. I paid for it and it's non-refundable. When the sergeant left, she did not go to the hotel, wrote me and said it wasn't suitable for her. Although it was at LAX, it wasn't suitable for her and her family. So I'm gonna find another place and I'm going to charge you for it. And I told her that's not going to be. Oh, by the way, this is the most important. She has refused from the time she got approved with Section 8 not to ever talk to me verbally, not to call her phone number, not to text her ever. The only way you are to contact me, and it's been in writing about 10 times, not less than 10 times in each one of her emails, you can only contact me using a U.S. P-mail or email only. I'm so, sorry, you don't get to dictate the rules. How do I combat this though? I don't wanna pay $30,000 to make myself right. How do I deal with it? Miriam, we've been working together for a while now, right? Yes, that's correct. This answer, I don't have on the tip of my tongue, but you okay. know I'm gonna come up with a plan of action, but sometimes it takes me a while. Okay. 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 Sometimes it takes me a while because I don't have an answer for you and my head's going a million miles an hour and I want to help you. Right. But man, you got Medusa in there, girl. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And everybody, she is what you would call a professional tenant. No, uh, she's, she's not. No, no, she's not. No, she is not. Really? If you go no. What do you call it? The litigious tenants, what are they called? What they have like eight or nine cases that I did not know about uh, because she has each time she negotiates for them to uh, be sealed. So you don't know about them. So if I had known this, uh, she the law's going to seal the case anyway if it's an eviction, because if it goes over 60 days. Oh. It's called the eviction masking law. It was implemented January 1st, 2017, and evictions have not shown on credit reports since then. But forget the credit report. Can't you still go downtown LA and see them in the courts? What was no. filed? No, they're masked. They're no. masked. Okay. Yes. Oh, masked. oh, wow. I did not know that. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. That's why I'm here. I'm here to educate. <laughs> there was nothing that I can do to prove that this person was evicted once they did this. Once they the, did this. Let, me, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. If they were a very litigious tenant and they were considered a professional tenant, they'd mm -hmm. be put on the court's vexatious litigant list. Okay. Okay. And then that's free to the public to look at vexatious litigant lists. That's where they put all the people that just file lawsuit after lawsuit. And that's what they do for a living. 
In my mind, a professional tenant is one that rakes you over the coals for an eviction, doesn't ever pay you any money, and stays in your house for 24 months. Oh, okay. That's the difference. That's a professional tenant. (laughs) Okay. Huge difference. And you know that jury trial you just paid for? Yes. I guess at those prices being about 130000 for a litigious tenant. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, I think I did the right thing. I'm not really sure by going in there and requesting that I uh, go ahead and um, release the case without prejudice, dismiss it. I, I don't know, but I know one thing. I'm not, I'm already down 14 grand. I did not want to add another 30 grand to that equation. I completely and totally understand you. Right now, I don't want to spend a dime. Exactly. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. I get it, especially in this economy. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So give me see. give me some time. I'll wrap my head around it. And if I come up with a plan, I'll reach out to you immediately. No joke. Please okay? do. Please do. Yeah, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. All right, you guys. Um, I think we're done for today unless somebody so, has sorry, Patty. I had um I put my question in the notes, but mine is um, oh, I'm just... I, I might have missed it. What do you got? No, no worries. Um toilet down for four hours. Uh plumber came out same day. Do I have to issue a rent credit or um I mean it was only four hours, so same do day service to... doesn't require a rent credit, a reasonable amount of time for the landlord to respond is within the next business day. Mm-hmm. If you did it same day, I don't believe that a rent credit is is warranted. They were inconvenienced for four hours. If you want to be real nitpicky, you could take one thirtieth of your rent, which would give you your daily per diem, and then take that and divide it by 24 hours and then see how much four hours is and ask them if they want a rent credit for that four hours for their inconvenience. Because I guarantee you, it's going to be about four bucks. Perfect. That's what I was thinking. Thank you. Yeah, but I wouldn't even offer it because if you offer it over something so petty, they're going to expect it every time. If they're asking you for it, I would say, look, I responded the same day. That's reasonable. I literally have until next business day and it was done same day. So no, at this point, I'm not issuing a credit. Okay. And you know what? I actually thought you were going to tell me to issue the rent credit being that it was a toilet down just because it was plumbing and, you know, they can't use a restroom for four hours, which I mean, that's an inconvenience. Super long, I mean, it is a bit. But an not. inconvenience. Okay, got it. Okay, Is thank you. Is there another restroom in the house? No, it's two okay. bedroom, one bath. Okay, but I mean, come on, it's four hours. Did they have a problem? Did they go talk to the neighbor? Did they tell you, are they kibitzing at you or no? No, I just didn't know if I needed to yeah. um, offer it because I did, you know, for the stove. And I remember I told you about the stove. They were without a stove for, I don't know, five days. But so you have to. Four hours on a toilet, I wouldn't. You did it same day. Give me a okay. break. Okay, gotcha. And, Perfect. And you don't want to keep giving them every time, every time, unless you really, if, unless you're required to, because then they're going to expect it. Then they're okay. going to make repairs just so you give them a credit. <laughs> gotcha. And even with the stove thing, um, st- we had it, you know, got the stove the same or ordered it the same day. Obviously, it couldn't be delivered same day. But in hindsight, I'm like, maybe I should have put for the stove like we no warranty, like the old stove, no warranty is given. Like we're providing the stove, but we're not responsible for it. Can you do that? You are required by law to provide an oven stove in your property because if the oven stove isn't working, it becomes a habitability issue. Some contracts don't include a stove. Some contracts don't include a refrigerator. The reality of that statement is some tenants own their own refrigerator. Nobody owns their own stove. Okay? And if their stove breaks and their oven doesn't work, does that mean you have to pay it because it's a habitability issue? Stop. Keep it simple. Make it your stove. You fix it. Perfect. Thank you. No worries. It's just my way of keeping it easier. You know, there's so much that happens in our lives, you guys, in this industry that we can't control. We can't grab a hold of. It's nickel and dime going on all over the place. Keep your exposure as minimum as you can. 
Sometimes by providing the stove, you eliminate this huge problem that could be right down the road the next day, you know? What if they bought their stove at a thrift store? It doesn't work, and now you got to pay to fix it. It's garbage, okay? Just provide the stove. It's a much easier business practice. Um, Built-in microwaves, your responsibility, landlord. Garbage disposal, your responsibility, landlord. Uh, trash compactor, your responsibility, landlord. Any appliance that's there when they move in is your responsibility, landlord, unless you wrote in the contract that the appliances such as, and take note of what I'm mentioning, the washing machine and the dryer are there for the tenant's convenience and the owner will not maintain them. Why? Because a washer dryer is an amenity and not a requirement. <laughs> a water heater requirement. Got it? Hope that all makes sense. All right, I am gonna end this for today unless anybody else has anything. You guys, I am not gonna do the um, cocktails and conversation this evening. I have decided to do that at the end of October. So the last Wednesday at the end of October, we're gonna do cocktails and conversation. I believe we're gonna have a guest speaker for that. Um, we should have Dan Yukelson from the Apartment Association and he'll be able to answer your questions about those assembly bills directly. So nice to have him in our, in our wheelhouse. I'm here if you guys need me. There's a couple people that I'm supposed to talk to today. Val, you're one of them, don't forget that. And I heard somebody try to say something. Um, nope. Quickly, say you're no longer with fast eviction. If we want to do three day notice that, um, to pay for, who should I call? You call whoever you want to. I don't prepare or serve notices. It's not something that I offer. I just yeah. offer you direction. So if you want to use fast evict, by all means, you have the capability of doing that. Got it. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> That's why I always tell you guys, you call your legal counsel. <laughs> well, thank you, Patty. It's All right, thank you. Information and learning today. Thanks. Thank you, guys. You guys have a great day, and we'll all catch up again next week. Patty, it's your sisters. Yes, baby. So I don't know if you saw our note, but we're wondering, you know, if you can send us an invoice for any work that you've done on our behalf. Absolutely. And for the remainder, if we could just have like a credit going forward on our widget subscription to pay the remainder, that would be great rather than, you know, paying us back in a check or anything. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to do that. And I'll do that for you today. Thank you. Love you, Patty. And if you still need me for anything, you let me know. Thank you. We love you. Thank you so much. I love you guys too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.